Good evening. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, my name is uh, Pierre Belanger. Um, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Landscape Architecture and uh, co-director of the MDES program. Uh, Mohsen um, Mostafa he sends his regrets. He uh, unfortunately had to um, travel to London for Zaha Hadid's uh, funeral um, with, with colleagues. Um, so I am standing in for him this evening, but it's actually a rare pleasure um, to, uh, to, to introduce someone who's actually been a huge, not only a huge influence, uh, but uh, I'll share a small anecdote without, um, without embarrassing him about the fact that he not only saved part of my career, but also of my marriage. Um, uh, this evening's presentation is also brought uh, to us by uh, the Aga Khan program here uh, that was brought to the GSD in 2003 uh, for the study of Islamic architecture, landscape, um, and, and, has ev and planning has evolved over the past few years in terms of engaging uh, questions of, of territory, ethnicity, citizenship, and, and of course, uh, uh, notions uh, of states and, and what citizenship means today. Uh, so, and, and I couldn't think of a more appropriate time uh, to, to actually have Abdul Malik uh, Simon with us uh, this evening. Um, we'll be having also a conversation um, with, um, uh, with two guests that um, we have also the rare pleasure of having here this evening um, with us, uh, Sarah Nutal um, and um, Achille uh, Membe. Uh, they're both uh, professors from uh, the uh, uh, Vidvaderstand uh, University in South Africa, and they're both here uh, now in fellowships, uh, Hutchinson Center and the Center for African Studies. Uh, so if you'd like to stick around as well after the conversation um, that, uh, and the presentation, it'd be great to have a, a more interactive conversation about the subject this evening. I thought it would actually be appropriate to share some observations on the work of Abdul Malik Simon, given the fact that as, um, as both an undergraduate student and later as a graduate student working on the Harvard Project on the City, which to a certain extent was addressing questions of territory, questions of state, and questions of citizenship at a period of time in which we can begin to remember and place into context matters and questions of urbanization that at the end of a century in a kind of thrust and push towards the change of the millennium, there was kind of like revolutionary changes that were happening in the 1980s and 1990s, already before the so-called transformation into the new millennium. Uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall at the end of the 1980s, uh, uh, um, the, the, the fall of the regime of apartheid in the early 1990s, um, catastrophes uh, associated with uh, the Chernobyl plant as well as the mid-1980s, notions of territorial, political, technological, and even technical notions of permanence all of a sudden start to begin to dissolve not just over a matter of years, but sometimes toppled even over matters of nights, hours. Revolutions can be counted in practical minutes and seconds. Uh, it's both a remarkable revolutionary change, but also at the same time, one can be cautious in terms of either celebrating or fearing those changes in terms of truly potentially understanding that perhaps they reframe our discourses and. Uh, uh, and, and ways of thinking about urbanization itself. Um, two aspects that are particularly important, I think, uh, to, to the work of, of Abdul Malik Simon is the kind of grounding of knowledge in kind of a lived experiences of urbanization itself. And the second one um, for me, which is both of them have been important in terms of his studies on, on markets specifically but also generally his work on uh, trying to understand forms, uh, processes, and projections, and relations of power. Um, and, and we'll hopefully get into the conversation this evening in terms of potentially you know, uh, raising the question that, that whether or not the study of urbanization is truly not just a territorial question, but uh, a spatial question about asking um, uh, how power is expressed, inscribed, symbolized, signified, and, and um, uh, uh, over long periods of time. Abdul Maluk uh, is, uh, is an urbanist. Um, 
He's also a research professor at the Max Planck Institute for the study of religious and ethnic diversity, um, as well as being a visiting professor of sociology at Goldsmiths uh, College, uh, University of London. Um, he's also a visiting professor at the uh, African Center for Studies, University of Cape Town, um, and also, uh, if that wasn't enough, and I think this starts to explain uh, the air miles that he essentially gains, um, is also a research associate with the Rujak uh, Center for Urban Studies in Jakarta. Um, for the past three decades, uh, he's essentially been working uh, on these lived experiences associated with uh, urban, urban economies and social experience, but specifically uh, on social interchange, cognition, local economy, and constitutions of power relation, constitution of power relations um, that, that affect how heterogeneous, heterogeneous African and South, South East Asian cities are lived, focusing on the concrete challenges of remaking municipal systems, training local government personnel, and I think this is the commitment, designing collaborative partnerships among technicians, residents, artists, and politicians. There, there's, there's two passages that I'd like to sort of bring forth here. Um, the, amidst a number of, of incredible interviews that Abdi Malik has shared, uh, one of them with um, Philippe uh, de Boc and Vijanti Rao, um, urbanism beyond architecture, uh, African cities as infrastructure, um, as well as a, a number of other sort of texts that have embodied his work. There's, there's a text uh, from 19, early 1990s, amidst a period of revolutionary spatial transformation, Invisible Governance, the Art of African Micropolitics. And I'd just like to, this was published in 1994, um, small, almost like guidebook pocketbook form. Africans may, in the long run, be well prepared to act in a future devoid of national or international cohesiveness, a world of interdependent popular neighborhoods which, like multinational corporations, blur the meanings of borders and ideologies. In this regard, contemporary African social cultural practices could be said to constitute a new form of political training, one that can respond to the dissolution of the nation as a legacy of colonialism. To think about Abdul Malik Simon as a designer is also to think of him as an undesigner. The words that he speaks and also in between the lines, we can also begin to understand that in order to intervene, in order to transform, in order to change, needs to acknowledge existing power structures in place. It's a kind of challenge. It's a kind of uh, rappel à l'ordre, even maybe potentially a rappel uh, à au désordre, to be able to understand maybe how we need to disorganize existing structures that are in place. Um, those words are meaningful for me and the book uh, Invisible Governance, given the fact that when I was working on the Harvard project on the city and studying the, the city of Lagos, or Lagos actually turned out to be a completely set of different states, um, the book allowed me to understand a particular form of power relations uh, in trade by being able to see an urban condition through markets. In, in fact, if anything, in order to understand Lagos, one needs to be able to see and understand what markets are. Um, from their trade relations, to their materials, to the spaces, to their temporalities. In fact, it wasn't actually until about 12 years later that I submitted my graduate thesis uh, 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 that I began to understand that by observing systems of markets over time, revisiting Lagos, that I actually began to understand that its form was actually in its transitions over a long period of time, as opposed to the typical level of field work, which is about snapping pictures, essentially documenting, mapping one instance. Um, I, I mean, I hope that does justice to the words and also what we have happen to see in between the lines. Um, I mentioned I have this anecdote uh, in regards to to the work. When when I was um, when we when I was on my honeymoon with my my wife uh, Miho Mazareo, um, who's at MIT, she's an architect and a, a wonderful urbanist and landscape architect. She asked me why I was drawing a map of a series of junction, road junctions and markets in Bangkok. And uh, I found this tollway stub that literally had the diagram of the entire city. And I was fascinated by this idea that on the Dong Muang tollway stub, 
is a diagram of all these kind of junctions. I started making this map and Miho kept on saying, like, why are you doing this? Like, yeah, this is the middle of our honeymoon. And I said, no, no, this is really important. This is no one has ever written about this, observed this in this kind of manner. And I stuck to it. And, and she kept on bringing this up over the years. And finally, I was reading On the Frontier of the Urban Periphery in 2007 by Abdul Malik Simon. And this uh, text that I had written was published in an obscure journal, to Bangkok.com. And I had no idea how Abdul Malik had found it. But essentially, he'd cited it in a way in terms of a way of seeing the city through junctions and through markets. And I began to wonder w whether or not I should show this to Miho and say, I know it's been about nine years since, the, since that time, but it was, actually, it was really worth it. But, but more importantly, it also came at a time in which most of my colleagues were putting into question looking at markets as a landscape architect, looking at uh, very large agglomerations through these trade relations over long periods of time. This long time and this long way of doing research is, um, uh, uh, is a way of doing things which, which I think you've contributed, at least to me personally, but also I think to a number of people that, that are paying attention. Um, the, the, the other observation that I'd like to make is, um, is, is the influence of, of being able to see in time and being able to understand power itself. And I can't help to invoke a conversation this evening that no doubt will be about uh, the space of urban environments, the relations and projections and processes of power, but also about universal history. Um, Susan Buck Morse in a text uh, called Hegel and Haiti, 2001. Universal history is visible at the edges. The mutual recognition between the past and present that can liberate us from the reoccurring cycle of victim and aggressor can occur only if the past to be recognized is on the historic map. It is in the picture. Even if it, not, if it is not in a place, we need to see a historical space before we can explore it. At a period of time, I think, in which there's this spatial and territorial conversations about race and politics at a period in time in which there's periods of independence that are being celebrated or eras of post-colonialism. What, what I find particularly interesting as part of the work of Abdul Malik Simon and, and the work that Susan Buck Morse remind us is that although we may have officially gained independence in certain areas or whether or not there's certain levels of freedom that are declared, that, that maybe in many respects the conversation about power is just about to begin and that we have to rescale the tools, the instruments, and the ways of seeing. I'd like to think, if anything, uh, Abdul Malik Simon has taught us over the past 30 years, and I think, and actually positively continues to do so, um, understanding how to see, how to experience the invisibility of those relations in order to make our own explorations, our own influences, and our own actions visible. Please welcome. Abdul Malik Simon. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that very caring introduction, and thanks everyone for for coming out. Um, my my apologies. I've been on the road for three weeks, playing one juke joint after another. And uh, now that I've reached the Apollo of American urbanism, uh, I'm not quite sure what it is I'm going to say. I've, I've, been, I've been talking about the theft of auto construction and the evisceration of, of collective black urban life, and I've depressed myself so much that I'm not going to do that. But, so in some sense, I'm going to make a gesture to some, some more uncertain eventualities. Eventualities in the sense that, yeah, I mean, something is probably going to go down, but maybe not, but maybe we could do something different, but 
I'm not really sure about it. it's going to work, but maybe it's it's worth the chance. But well, we th this kind of sense of being in the midst of a sense of multiple eventualities. Um, we a, a lot of I mean cities are, are are proliferating with new kinds of divides, new kinds of interfaces, new kinds of. Uh, strange uh, things coming in in face of each other. So I have a very modest aim tonight, which is basically to think about the interfaces between uh, a couple of huge new vertical towers in the set in the midst of popular neighborhoods in the urban Jakarta and core. And think about what those divides, what those interfaces might, what questions, just mostly what questions they, they would seem to suggest. But in, in moments of uncertainty like this, I'll just turn to the Quran and talk about this notion of triple darkness, this surah, this verse, one of the most quoted verses in black America, uh, refers to a notion of the the complexity of notions of divides. Because in some sense, triple darkness, okay, so we, we all born, what, what the Quran is telling us here is that we're, we're all born in a kind of darkness. We're born uh, within our mother's wombs. There, there's a certain kind of lines of interiority from which we emerge. Um, and in, in, but with a particular, so we're born with a particular kind of genealogy. We, we're born to be located. We're born to be held. We're born to be fixed. We're born to be located. We're born to be territorialized. But in the in the Quran, the triple darkness is a kind of inversion of this kind of line. That is, instead of birth coming from a kind of interior darkness, birth also emerges from the world itself. It's the inversion of the womb. So that no matter how we're identified, how we're located, we're always somewhere else than where people think we are. That is, in some sense, we always exist. We come into existence as unlocatable, unidentifiable. And the Quran is talking here about the interface of this kind of birth, this kind of creation. The creation that makes us somewhere identifiable and the creation which means that we can be anything whatsoever. And it is that kind of interface which in some ways is instructive for perhaps how we might think about the divides and interfaces at work in particular kinds of urban formations. Uh, there's another interpretation of this triple darkness that maybe more approaches what Brian Masumi has called the, the, the bare activity, the imperceptible adjustments and the immediately lived hypotheses about what is about to happen that incline persons to attend to particular textures, pathways uh, in the landscape at hand. Again, a, a sense of, another sense of, eventu of, of eventuality about what is about to happen, and hypotheses about that, which lead us into a particular ways of attending to things which isn't necessarily prescribed or mapped. Um, so what the Quran is telling us in this verse, then, is a kind of multiplicity of what divisions mean, OK? Exclusion, eliminations, exigencies to integrate, the, the, the sort of the romance of integration, parallel worlds, inverted relations, being something always contingent upon being anything whatsoever, a kind of technical instrument where nothing legitimates the transition from inscribing that divides to the sense made of these divisions, meaning always on the verge of collapse, this is, in some sense, what the Quran, that, that verse in the Quran is telling us about the notion of division. Also, the notion that, to paraphrase Alex Galloway, that the commons, the urban commons, is, is not really an equilibrating, equilibrating mechanism of redistributed opportunities and resources. Rather, it is a particular kind of operation of boundaries, 
not a specific place, but an agitated friction, a moment when something transitions into something else, passes from one medium or scale into another. So in this sense, these are some of the, some, so in the second part of, I, I, I'll, I'm going to give some sketch about some concepts that I'm, I'm working with, but in the second part of my talk, basically I'm going to show images of, of the, these three huge projects and their surrounds. So all the images are either of the projects or the, of the surrounds, but these, this is the kinds of interfaces, the kinds of divides, the kinds of frictions that I'm that I'm I, I'm I'm talking about so I mean almost all representations of urban processes they all they raise the question about divides it's a question about how to make the cut that makes the difference between the city and the non-city the intensive the extensive for no matter how nonlinear actual relationships may be, political entities that speak and act in the name of some collective always need to figure boundaries. Boundaries between what counts and what don't count, what is relevant or not, what is necessary to pay attention to or what it is not, because nobody can pay attention to everything. One has to decide. One has to decide what it is to, to pay attention to. And even as all these decisions are really difficult, more difficult to make, and even as more decisions are made for us through algorithmic interoperability, the pragmatic necessity of boundary making remains. So if the urban is not so much a particular kind of space or time, but rather a field through which both space and time can be differentiated, simultaneously in all kinds of ways, then the urban is indifferent to any particular formation or content at any given moment. But if this is the case, if this is a kind of fundamental, con if the indifference is a kind of fundamental constitutive condition, then our very ability to, con our very ability to consider specific places and persons and events that take place within the urban as having stable identities in their own right, depends upon us being blind to this indifference. So it's a kind of a con game in a way. It's a kind of thing that we got to pay attention and not pay attention at the same time. So in some sense, it goes back to this notion of, trip, of, trip, of triple darkness. So if we want to, for example, understand the relationship between global capital and the local vernaculars of a particular city's way of living, we got to tell some story about what happens when the two meet. But the very ability to demarcate a line in the sand through which a story of the interaction of, I mean, what is, what is global capital? What are local vernaculars? The very ability to draw that line in order to tell that story, gender, it stems from a basically fairly inert technical maneuver. It's a maneuver detached from any sense of collective will. The line is simply drawn as a kind of technical act that knows no boundaries and owes nothing to the particular characteristics of those that deploy it. But you see, that can be an advantageous thing because no matter how accountable and compliant residents may be to larger authorities, no matter how much external institutions intrude and appropriate, it has been possible for residents to develop insides of their neighborhoods and districts that have enabled them to experiment to explore opportunities of livelihood and sociality other than those that are either the norm or that are preordained. So the indifference of the technical act of boundary drawing can cut many different ways. And then endurance then becomes a matter of bridge building. And these are not bridges that can join distinct entities into common purposes or resemblances or mutuality but rather bridges that point to breaks in particular procedural frictions in the putting to get work of different operating systems. Again, it's sort of like this romance of integration, which says that the, the bridge joins. We are now one big happy family and that we will endure through whole, walking hand in hand together into. But without such frictions, there's little motivation to work out ways of associating things that have no overarching reason to be associated. We tend to assume too much from the get-go that things should be associated, that things should be integrated, that things should get along, that things should be together. But without such frictions, there's no motivation to work. There's no motivation to try stuff out. 
So these are bridges that reiterate the separation of things. Yet it, this is a separateness within view, where different domains and practices need not warrant continuous accommodation, but are still accessible to different parties as disruptions of routinized assumptions. They can be experienced without the compulsion to try to understand them. And as such, these bridges articulate a wide range of possible futures that people could assume whether this ever actually happens or not. Again, the notion of eventualities. Could happen, could not, maybe will, probably will. If it don't, well, what then? Sometimes residents were consciously attuned to all the exertions performed in kitchens and workshops and streets and bedrooms, factory floors and storerooms and vacant lots and all the angles and interstices in between. And this labor of paying attention, you know, again, because you have to, you have to sort of walk that thin line, this triple darkness between being in both, uh, being concerned and indifferent to all of the kinds of decisions that you have to make about what you pay attention to. Well, in some ways, in some ways, districts in, in the center of Jakarta work because that labor of paying attention was distributed across persons and networks and distributed across spaces and materials as, as well. The daily wear and tear of objects and people, all of the links and cuts, all of the decisions that had to be made, about who to devote time and resources to, about where to go, where to buy, were also complicated, also complemented by an entire world of, again, eventualities, inputs, effects, and relations where no explicit decisions were made, where people simply postponed or held in abeyance the need to state who they were or to make a decision to take this road or, or, or that road. So whatever exists in a city is a convergence of multiple forces and backgrounds. The interfaces where all of the apparent difference between the slum and the formal settlement, the illicit economies and standardized production. Boundaries remain, but boundaries which each of these differentiations have in common. They divide, but they also have the division become something that they each have in common. And so these interfaces make them more than what they are the boundary as both combination and division, all right? So the sense of dividing the divides is both the occasion for combination and the occasion for division. And sometimes the difference we have to be indifferent to or take the risk of being indifferent to. It's because residents always in a sense had to ask certain kinds of questions like, where do you look? How closely and how long? To what extent is what takes place on the surface the very thing that's really going on? When residents have long known that, they have been, that they're being scrutinized, they'll take measures to deflect attention. And when residents have long known that no one is really paying attention and doesn't care what happens to them, then they'll take measures to make their existence count somehow. Now, when these two situations are combined, all kinds of strange diffractions are possible. And it's not then always clear who got authority or not, who got money or resources or who got opportunities or not. Because you want to be paid attention to, but at the same time, you don't want to be paid attention to. Because the more you're paid attention to, the more they got you, the more than which they can define exactly what it is you're able to do. But you, you want to be recognized in some way. So how do you walk that walk? I mean, how do you walk, again, that particular kind of line? So in any given instance, what might be taking place is never far from that which is taking place. For it is this very proximity, again, of eventuality, of that which might indeed be going on or is possible, and present conditions that enable livelihoods and opportunities to be both made and shifted. Whatever is made then shifts in terms of its availability to specific users, uses and users. It just not, I mean, auto construction was not just a process of making stuff. It was making stuff and then shift, and then changing. You make stuff in order to give you a platform to then shift gears to do something different. Okay, I'm the same thing. Ben Bratton basically reiterating that. See, because this process of auto construction, where, where 
people essentially created particular ways of life and auto construction, not just about people building the homes to live in or providing themselves with services, but the construction of particular kinds of ways of life depended upon intricate ways of allocating land and opportunities, working out divisions of labor and complementary efforts, enabling individuals to experiment with their own particular ways of doing things, but within concerts in concert with others their own particular singularities in concert, not this sort of romantic sense of a community where we're all together and we all do the kind of same thing. Thus, governance in institutions, I mean, we often see that cities lack effective governmental institution, the lack of governance. It wasn't so much that the lack of governance is there, it just wasn't where we were, lo we, we were looking for it in all of the wrong places. So that governance institutions were distributed across different kinds of relationships and spaces rather than necessarily being located in specific offices and bureaus and sectors and territories or functions. In other words, institutions existed, but in a dispersed rather than centralized form across the landscape of relationship of residents as they actively parceled and settled land, as they actively elaborated provisioning systems, as they actively attempted to insert themselves in the flows of materials and food and skills and money. And this process of, of auto construction, this, this sort of making these ways of life, is not now being undermined so much by a totalizing state, but because the state increasingly looks like them. Because the state increasingly looks like the very thing that residents themselves were doing. The undermining comes from, in some sense, the sense that the, the state mirrors the very kinds of efforts that residents themselves, the very kinds of institutions, not so much from a kind of totalizing, uh, violent, I mean, the state is still can be totalizing and violent, but the real undermining comes in some sense because the state begins to mirror in significant ways these very kinds of processes. The same way that infrastructure is more than infrastructure and the way in which housing is being I mean, the, in Jakarta, there, between now and 2011, there will be a half a million new uh, units of affordable housing, of so-called affordable housing. I mean, five years, a half a million new units up, many of them already in existence. And I would argue that the, like new, these new spatial products inter, introduce new ways of inhabiting the city. I mean, on one hand, households and neighborhoods are sliced and diced into particular profiles and niche markets and probabilities, or they're re reassembled into more effer effervescent or provisional forms that need not take the notion of the citizen into consideration, their welfare, but still generate value through precipitating new demands and needs and desires. You see, because in some sense, when you make anything these days, when you try to do anything, What's relevant or not? What's relevant to something to be successful or not? You have to take into consideration more and more vari variables, more and more different kinds of considerations. So in order to work, you have to require a way of visualizing and calculating how behaviors and events and capacities exert particular effects in various combinations of, of variables. So sociality is continuously re-sculpted as the excess that potentiates continuous accumulations. So residents are steered into mobilizing funds from wherever they can get their hands on it to acquire an asset that they are uncertain as to how they will use, but which they feel compelled to acquire as the best available option. So new forms of housing then become a device in the reconfiguration of the social, in part to domesticate a new urban body, but also the way in which housing, the way in which the built environment also attempts to instigate unforeseen, presently non-representable modalities of the social. That is the sense that infrastructure produces an excess of sociality for which we don't necessarily have exactly the words or the terms to define. That seems to be the key of urban capital in some ways produce forms of sociality that can be addressed, but we don't necessarily know what it exactly it is that we're, we're, we're talking about. Mobile, effervescent, really mutable uh, in, 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 in a lot of different ways. So with that kind of just basic conceptual sketch, I just want to show images then 
of some of these projects and the surrounds. So in the sense, these are, these are projects that basically usually average between 15 and 17,000 units. So you're introducing uh, up to 35 to 40,000 new residents in a particular area of, of, of the city. So these are sort of, these are sort of three. Um, and these are fairly, then these are situated in the urban core, in historically popular, popular districts. Um, and you'll see the, you'll see the surrounds. And they're, they're, they're usually 36 square meters to the largest are sort of 40 square meters. Um, they cost roughly around 40,000 US dollars. Uh, almost all these units are sold before the project starts, so they're sold in advance. Uh, a lot of them then are flipped uh, for a 30% increase, usually for before they're completed. Uh, but usually the developers require that the entirety of the, uh, of the unit be paid for before it's completed. There are no, in Indonesia, there's not really a, a mortgage system. Developers offer their own financing, which runs from basically 12 to 36 months of, of uh, usually 30% uh, down. The rest has to be paid for. And, and usually all of these units are sold in advance of the of of, of, of the start of the of, of, of the project, but the idea is is that you know you know you know 36 square meters ain't much of 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 nothing, um, so there's a particular imaginary in mind about the kind of social configuration that then actually is going to occupy these these units. So just to give a sense of the of the surrounds. And the interesting thing, too, is that the surrounds are also not losing population. The surrounds are also increasing population as well, in the sense that there's more demands on these kinds of, so you have this kind of interface where both the vertical, afford, the vertical towers add you know, 40 to 50,000 new residents within a particular area, but the surrounds also increase in, in population because of the demand of a lot of young people looking for cheap accommodation who can't afford either the rents or the, uh, uh, within the, 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 the other units. So you have this sort of massive increase of the core in a city that officially is supposedly losing, losing population. So all of these images are within five minute walking distance of the, of, of, of the developments. So when, the acquisition of housing units also becomes a kind of opportunity to mobilize different kinds of finance. So some entails pure speculation. Some involve very extensive lateral networks of borrowing configured across family networks and other associational ties, like members of a particular prayer group will over time uh, loan each other money, mobilize money that are involved in their kinship networks in order to acquire uh, particular flats. Businesses and institutions may buy units for staff with the intent to rent. Sometimes assets are traded as when older residential properties are rented out unofficially for commercial purposes and where their owners take one to two years of rent up front to purchase clusters of contiguous new units on a given floor. That is, all of the new commercial developments in Jakarta you have to pay US dollars for. But if you have a, like a two, three story house in a kind of area near the urban core, you can pay in local currency. So someone who, who, someone who owns that property can rent out three years in advance, take the money, and oftentimes they'll use it to buy one of the... Um, so oftentimes these are in turn rented out to extended families who cluster together in a series of individual apartments. Oftentimes the destination of financial diversions where money is basically laundered in the acquisition of an asset that can be used to access re regular lending. So these, these new developments become a kind of, 
uh, locus through which multiple forms of financial mobilization become, become activated. And they're also very interestingly vehicles through which collective accumulation, earnings that are the result of collaborative efforts, such as non-formal markets, integrated production workshops, saving groups, and improvised pension schemes, which do not belong specific to specific individuals, is put to work. A lot of people who run informal markets collectively are taking the proceeds and they're buying into these, uh, into these vertical towers. Now, in the old time popular religion, that is the sort of economies of the popular neighborhood, value was calculated in terms of a wide range of provisional sutures where space is created to accommodate different ways of doing things, different ways of securing livelihood, different ways of consolidating particular collective identities, warranted various taxations. You know, extractions of money and fees under the table, not from official national governments or local authorities, to support a kind of tenuous game of auto-construction. And so in some ways, the, the very, the, the very auto-constructed popular districts relied upon their own forms of speculation, their own forms of securitization and debt swaps and derivatives. In some ways, the ways in which they operated are homologous to the very terms of financialization that we're all, that we're, that they were very familiar with. But in some ways, the, the, some of the real inventors of these things had very different kinds of uses and ideas in mind particularly in situations where factories pretended to be boarding houses and boarding houses pretended to be factories and where offices pretended to be single family homes and single family homes pretended to be offices. Now, whatever was extracted, the, the kind of monetary extraction from these kinds of economic activities had to be always recalibrated in terms of their impact on what was to be facilitated or protected and the money plowed back into being able to, to, do, to do new things. But now how these popular neighborhoods are situated within a larger urban fabric is something that's much more volatile. There are a lot more uncertainties as to how particular facets of the neighborhood are connected to the broader city, to broader institutions. So it becomes more difficult for sort of local regulatory agents and authorities, those that extracted those kinds of fees, to plow back, to attune the calculations of extraction to the actual capacities of the economic activities taking place. So as authorities claim spread and intensify and competition and crowdedness intensify within particular economic sectors, these kinds of extractions, these kinds of fi local financial systems become impediments to action and collaboration. So they usher in a need for more precise calculations as to the value of everyday labor, available assets, and expected profitability. So in some sense, residents ask, how do we now calculate the effort, all this more and more effort that we have to put into keeping what it is that we have alive and going? How do we, how do we evaluate our efforts? How do we assess what, 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 what it means? And this is a kind of then a kind of hook. I mean, even in this situation, in order for the residents to, to, to so you know, you know, developers play this kind of game of, play, of put, playing residents off of each other. And in this particular building, they've tried to hedge against that by in some sense saying, we'll protect ourselves, we'll insulate ourselves from that game by making it look like all these are individual units. And from the outside, they look like an old social housing project that has people have bought and turned into. But all of these units are not really individual units. You enter in one door, you go up some stairs, you go across, I mean, you, you, you go up, you go across, you go through there, and the front door of your residence is really over, is over if you're residing over here, your front door is over here. And if you're residing over here, your front door, to make sure that from the outside is so confusing that no one knows really who, who, what space belongs to anyone else. But that's a lot of effort to go through in order to protect some kind of collective operation. It's very labor intensive. It's a lot of hard work. And how do people then somehow think about the value of what it is that they do? So 
On the other hand, the vertical towers seem to be all about quantification. The price per square meter, the number of inhabitants that can occupy a particular volume, the profitability derived through different streams of payment plans. It's seemingly devoid of, of social considerations. So even if it seems devoid, the vertical project does allow, however, an account, a kind of quantification of effort that gets hard to, to harder to assess in the surrounding popular neighborhoods in terms of what efforts residents actually do. So while it's possible to trace intricate assemblages of effort and material and map out complex relational webs, what does all of this popular labor actually do? How can it assume a representation that enables individual and collective deliberation? But at the same time, this new emphasis on quantification doesn't erase negotiations over how the residency composed, but actually, in some sense, intensifies it. Because who actually is going to live in these places? It's not mommy, daddy, me, and, and the two kids. This is Jakarta. This is not you know, mommy, daddy, me, and, and, and the two kids. This, it, so in some sense, the imaginary that who's going to live there doesn't correspond to the kind of occupancy that's going to make these things viable. After all, at the end of the day, they have to be occupied. They have to be inhabited. And how are they being inhabited? Well, they're being inhabited because the very ways of mobilizing all this finance means that people aren't buying individual apartments, they're buying whole floors. So one you know, extended family will buy an entire floor, or a mosque will buy an entire three floors, and, the, and, three, and members of that particular mosque will live in, in those three floors. Walls are being torn down inside to make room for families of eight, of, of, so the way in which they're actually occupied doesn't correspond to the imaginary through which the built environment, the, the, the built structure would suggest. So even the formats of space that are quantified and attributed particular financial symbolic value are not now viable in terms of how they are actually going to be lived. That is, there's a detachment between the imaginaries at work to render these projects affordable and profitable, and the modalities of inhabitation in which the projects are actually used. So in some ways, we tend to look at these things and we tend to think, oh, we know what they are. We know what's going on here. But do we? <laughs> that is, in, when you begin to look at the composition of the insides of these places, they become, in some sense, a kind of new rendering of a process of auto-construction through particular kinds of epistemologies of quantification that we would otherwise associate with the end of auto-construction. Okay. Just again to give you a sense of the so in some ways, what is the, what, at this interface, when the vertical looks at the popular, and when the popular looks at the vertical, what, what seems to be going on? So it is as if the popular looks upon the vertical and concludes that these new projects are the embodiment of all of their own attainments. That is, after all the work that we've done, we can finally get, we can finally get apartments modern apartments, modern amenities, we can finally become modern residents of, of this city. But at the same time, the popular also assumes the position of being the object of the gaze of the vertical, as if the mirror borrows my eyes in order to look at itself, and as such becomes aware of concrete instances of its own incompletion pointing to specific possible trajectories for the popular to update its own look and its own way of doing things. For the vertical may need to copy the popular in order to sustain itself, but the actual instantiation of this process of mimesis generates unanticipated results, constantly reworked, which constitute a different lens through which the popular can consider its own operations. So, in, so at the same time, precise quantification may be displaced, 
but the indeterminacy of value may only be grasped in a situation where the surfaces become available precisely to be quantified within a machine of inscription that divides the vertical project into concrete spatial prefabricated units which might make subdivisions and agglomeration impossible as phys physical and physical entities, but something else, new forms of the social that even work around those kinds of physical and financial constraints. This is in contrast to the built environment of the popular where physical structures are constantly being changed around with different discernible values being added on and subtracted. So despite how the structures of these projects would appear to shape a new kind of urban resident in Jakarta, an incipient new form of sociality perhaps is, is ensuing, is perhaps being, being born. So that in, in these surrounds, things, things are going on. People are not standing still. They're not resting still. They are, they are doing things. They're updating. They're trying to come up with new forms, new kinds of ways of, of, of doing things. For example, the, the, for example, all of the updates in the, in the way in which the, the waste at the interfaces between the vertical and the popular, the way these interfaces are being used to update the, the local waste business, to make it, to upscale it, to use waste to produce new kinds of products. Uh, to, uh, particularly feeding back into the, for the consumption of new residents within the vertical towers. See, always the question is, if the capacity to tell how people are related to each other is potentially up, uh, unsettled by spiraling circuits of mobility and exchange, how do urban bodies come together in ways that incorporate the overall fluid densities of urban life. That is, how do they defer expending a lot of, lot of energy defending particular ways of being social from such volatility, and thus enable them to recalibrate their coexistence with each other in ways that adapt to continuous movement, but in a manner in which they continue to experience themselves as somehow linked? This is always the question, always the question that people are asking, them, uh, asking themselves in a, in a constant way. You take the example, for example, of one of the projects, Kalibata, uh, the sort of the, this, one of the, mo the most infamous first generation of these vertical cities in the urban core that capitalizes on its local advantage, easy access to apartments, intricate layering of subcontracting, that composes a very much heterogeneous population, one of the most heterogeneous populations within Jakarta, more heterogeneous than the auto-constructed popular neighborhoods perhaps were able to, to construct. But here, what takes place is that there are mostly silent contestations amongst various kinds of residents and lifestyles. Islamic, lesbian, gay, bi, transsexual, young professionals, nascent, barely middle class families, immigrants, sex workers, all are contesting over control over floors in their specific buildings. So segments and clusters emerge. In fact, in this residential complex of 30,000 units, the owners are in court right now to try to regain their, their units because there have been so many subcontracting arrangements, so many way contestations over the way in which floors are acquired that the owners have lost ownership no longer means anything in this, in, in this city of 30,000 people. The owners are in court saying, we bought this shit. We, let, let's, can we get it back, you know? So the densities of living with ensure a kind of circulation of stories, of rumors, of information. The design of internal ground floor public spaces provide a lot of opportunities for people to watch each other. Yet the trajectories of external movement on the part of residents cut across a wide range of territories and institutions. Evidence that shows up in the recursive loops back into this complex that can be mined by others. Less the curating of an inside than a collective penetration and cultivation of a larger surrounds. It is from these kinds of developments where a kind of Barcelona model of, of politics will emerge in Jakarta. 
The auto-constructed neighborhood can't produce these kinds of politics. It has been so concerned about it being able to reproduce itself in a kind of internal, a constant internal recalibration. Here you have a kind of heterogeneity that doesn't worry too much about how it gets along with each other, but worries more about how to use this as a base to extend itself into the outside as long as there is a kind of circulation of stories. That is, does this place work? And how? How operable is it? What, how operable are these new forms of housing? How do they stand out in the midst of once viable popular district? Not as model, not as prototype, not as imaginary, but as a series of stories, sometimes silent stories, about things that never reach fruition but do something. Kalibata and its constant stories about what is the real deal. As long as there's all kinds of stories about the real deal, there is no then real deal that pins them down in any definitive way. In other words, residents seem to pay a great deal of attention to all the non-coherent practices that work or do not work with each other. Across authority, across Jakarta, the real authorities were always those that were avid collectors of stories. They listened to various reports, observed the wheeling and dealing of the assembled characters, engaged with various affordances, infrastructure, and routine. Again, a density of stories. So I just want to end basically on, on, on something about, about youth. Um, and some, some things that we, we've done a first round of, of a kind of study of youth across seven different cities of the, of the world, asking them, you know, what does it take to be in the, in, in, in the city? And one group of youth that we did lots of interviews with were young women, six, between 16 and 20, who basically, most of them living on their own, living in groups in boarding houses within the popular neighborhoods, uh, who oftentimes work in these large retail markets, not big shopping malls, but, but retail markets where people do the real, where they buy the real stuff, where, where, they, can, where they can afford things. And all these young sellers, they talk to each other. And through these interchanges, they get a sense of the market's atmosphere the fluctuations of prices, the capacity of owners to respond to new trends in volume, the capacity of owners to bundle the goods with others to offer wholesale prices to buyers coming from all over Indonesia and also pooling together their money. All these young sellers get a reading of who's in debt, who's making a lot of money, and then they try to find ways to get closer to the real action. Of course, there are a lot of failures in what owners do, either collectively or individually. And there's always a sense of urgency to recover from these failures. And this happens not only by reducing costs, but taking on new energetic labor, equipped with new ideas and solid experience. And these situations for many of these young girls are actively harvested, as some of the young girls put it. Most young labor will never make enough to become owners. They'll never ever increase their er earnings ever substantially. But this circulation through the market at least creates the semblance of trajectories. It creates the semblance of going somewhere, even if it's not necessarily going forward. But what these girls say time after time is that it allows us to continue telling stories. All right? It makes us and enables us to continue to be the tellers of stories. And so when you see them leave their shifts at, that start at 10 in the morning and end at 10 o'clock at night, they don't go back to their boarding houses where they, which they share one room with five or six other, other, uh, other women, which they may stay a month at a time, two months at a time. I mean, the average, by the time, in Jakarta, we figured that, the, that w w by the time you're 21, you've already had 10 different jobs. By the time you're 21, you've already lived in 15 different places since the time you're 15. They, in some sense, they don't go home. They, they congregate largely at 7-Elevens. And they, you know, from 10 until the early hours of the morning, what do they do? Telling stories with each other. Because the sense is, 
the, the sense of their sense. How do you be at the right place at the right time? There's no map for it. There are only stories about it. And where are we going to get these stories? Well, we don't sit in our boarding house to, to get, these kinds of, get these kinds of stories. Um, we have to. So in some sense, what, what, what I'm trying to, 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 to say here is in some way the, 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 that this, this interface, this interface between the popular and the vertical, this interface between the quantifiable and the non-quantifiable, this interface between the auto-constructed popular district and the kind of neoliberal put together affordable housing vertical tower cities is a kind of volatile interface. It's an interface worth asking a lot of questions of. It's an interface in some sense full of frictions, full of eventualities, which we may not, we, we, we shouldn't necessarily conclude what it is. We need to be able to be within them as in able to tell more and more stories about what possibly is going on and what possibly could be. Because in, or, in concluding, it seems that m many of these youth are basically saying what Fred Moten and Stefano Harney say in, 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 in the undercommons. In the trick of politics, we are insufficient, scarce, waiting in the pockets of resistance and stairwells and alleys in vain. The false image and its critique threaten the common with democracy, which is only ever to come, so that one day, which is only never to come, we will be more than what we are, but we already are. We're already here, moving. We've been around. We're more than politics, more than settled, and more than democratic. Thank you very much. I got his watch. Can I get, <laughs> I'm gonna sell it on eBay. I got stories about this watch. Um, that was incredible. Thank you very much, Abdul Malik. I'm, I'm amazed how you were able to do that without taking a drink of water. Um, I feel like we need to get a, a kind of like fire hose uh, to to cool the the room down. That I I, I think um, if you're able to essentially um, show us how to see differently. Um, again, the not only has the bar been raised, but but ultimately you're addressing a number of different questions that to a certain extent over the past few weeks, past few months, and in fact years, have been asked um, about the role of representation. Um, I, I think it'd be wonderful if everyone, if you'd like to stick around, um, we'd like to have a conversation, Abdul Malik. I, I know you, well, we gotta get you some water and, and, and maybe some oxygen. <laughs> um, is that we, we have, uh, uh, Achille Membe here and uh, Sarah Nuttall, um, who've been working together um, from, from uh, Vidvarstan University. Uh, they are here, um, Achille from the Center for African Studies here for the semester, as well as um, uh, Sarah Nuttall, who's here from the Hutchinson Center, uh, Hutchinson uh, uh, for, for, this, uh, for this semester. Um, they both have published extensively um, in a so-called post-colonial era on uh, different relations of power. They recently wrote uh, a sort of beautiful piece together uh, uh, in an anthology uh, as a result of the, uh, out of the, the death of Nelson Mandela recently, uh, Mandela's Mortality, um, uh, uh, and a series of texts since the, the 1980s and 1990s on essentially transforming uh, uh, structures in power. And I think I'd just like to invite Sarah, Achille, uh, Abdul Malik, if, if, if you, we can uh, muster the efforts here to have this conversation about both responding. Um, I think there's actually a number of questions that I have in relationship to this conversation. I'd like to kick it off in relationship to representation and, and then we can open it up for, for questions from the audience. Please join. I, I promise that I'll get it back to you. Um, so just very briefly, what, what I think um, 
what I think is really marvelous here, uh, Abdu Malik, is, and both also at the same time, both exhilarating and frightening, um, is this kind of shakedown. Uh, th there's this kind of uh, intellectual shakedown on, on matters of representation. I, I, there's one reading that I just want to offer here, which I think is, is, is relevant to the conversation that we've had um, over the past few weeks and months, the role of representation itself and how we see. Um, you invoked uh, Ben Bratton as part of your conversation, and he's uh, provided um, the question of whether or not we should be seeing like a state uh, and addressing questions of legibility um, to potentially sensing like a state. And I, I think in many respects, you've substituted or provided this alternative of, of maybe we're looking at the wrong thing. In fact, maybe we're just simply not hearing, in fact, what's going on. Um, to putting into question matters of integration in an era in which ecology, notions of ecological understanding are entirely based on making associations. You've put into question uh, the notion of integration and also at the same time put into question notions of borders. Um, you've managed to financialize an understanding of environment um, to the point at which we now see buildings as laundromats um, for, for, for money and through speculation. And then also put into question in, a, in an era of so much political focus on the state, um, the question of the story. So I find it particularly interesting in an era in which we spend a lot of time on streets, blocks, and buildings, um, you, you invoke fragments of ideas, you invoke stories, and I think particularly you invoke what are we actually building? Are we building cities or are we building myth? And it'd be nice to maybe potentially revisit uh, a number of the, the sort of the gauntlet that you lay down, but I'd like to invite Sarah and, and Achille, if, if we could, to, to potentially um, not just react, but just in terms of understanding from your respective fields, um, in many respects, what is also getting taken down in this conversation? I mean, we have in front of us a bit of a, well, an undesigner. I mean, if anything, in order to see things, we have to tear down a few things that are standing in the way. First of all, uh, uh, I really don't need to, to thank you for, for the, uh, uh, the presentation. Uh, I didn't expect less than what, what you offered. Uh, I'm speaking to Malik in, in, in these terms because we have worked together for a long time and I know him uh, very well. So you shouldn't be surprised by the, uh, the playful nature of, 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 of the exchange that, that will ensue. Um, my first thing, Malik is like, like a surgeon, um, but every time he cuts uh, the, uh, the city body, if we, we can uh, use such a term, um, w what we witness is, is uncontrollable. Uh, we, so many things appear that we, we don't know what to do with them. Uh, uh, where, where to go. Uh, we have no idea what is going on. Um, I took a lot of notes uh, during your presentation. I really liked the, uh, uh, the opening, uh, the verse uh, from the Quran. Uh, I wish we had time to, to go back to it and, and do a, a slow reading of, of that verse. Um, but we don't. Um, what I find fascinating in uh, Malik's work and, and the presentation tonight is that it's, um, it, it uh, raises all kinds of questions about um, a project that is so central to uh, the, uh, the modern project of, of knowledge, knowledge making and knowledge production. Um, how is it that we do right the real, what is the real? Whether it be the real of the city, uh, the, the real of, uh, of forms, uh, vertical forms, uh, or what he calls popular forms, probably a bit more horizontal than, than the first. 
And uh, part of what Malik seems to be telling us is that, in fact, the real, whatever this means, is always somewhat ahead of our attempt at writing it. And that, that there is a, um, a structure of, of failure that is uh, um, uh, inherent in the very uh, ambition of writing the real. And that this applies both to urban studies or other forms of uh, inquiry uh, uh, that one might think think about. But um, that uh, structure, structure of failure uh, is not in itself a reason to not try. And what he has done tonight, uh, he has tried uh, his best, uh, like a boxer, uh, uh, I mean with uh, uh, uppercuts, uh, with uh, uh, all kinds of uh, of blows. Uh, I'm not sure that he he knocked down, he knocked out uh, his opponent. Um, the opponent is still standing, and I think that for him, uh, that's just fine. It's just fine, and and in fact, we have to inhabit that structure of failure uh, as the the very condition for saying anything human, which means limited uh, about. Uh, what we are confronting. So that, for me, this was a, a, a high lesson of modesty. Uh, and in fact, he said it right, right at the beginning. Second point, and I'll stop. I was uh, very taken up by your elaborations on division, um, on separation, um, on um, drawing lines, on setting up boundaries, uh, something which is so uh, uh, an essential part of the times we live in, uh, which is, um, I mean, as, as we know, uh, many people want to build walls, uh, which will be paid by somebody else. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I was struck by uh, that uh, reference to um, separation uh, because of, uh, of the place where uh, we live, a place you know so well, uh, South Africa. And I was struck by this kind of afterlife of uh, apartheid because that was, is what apartheid was all about. Um, that as we, we try to bury apartheid in South Africa, in fact, it seems to uh, enjoy uh, an entirely new life uh, globally. Um, the, um, I didn't know exactly what, what, what to do with that, um, but, but it seems to me that it's part of this kind of metaphysics of uncertainty and radical indetermination uh, which you, uh, you, you, you told us uh, uh, about. Uh, what politics com comes out of it is not very clear to me. Um, uh, following you, uh, division, separation, uh, setting up boundaries uh, does not necessarily mean uh, not putting together a set of assemblages that allow people to, to make it from today to tomorrow, especially in, in the popular uh, sectors of urban life you were describing. Um, I, I, I was left with uh, uh, the fear that, in fact, we might be entering a time when uh, we inhabit uh, purely Hobbesian cities, uh, cities of radical indetermination, um, where things look uh, uh, one way, uh, but the way they look never really corresponds to uh, the way they actually operate. Uh, uh, and, and how then to, to, to live like this at a time when the demand for security, for safety, and certainty is so high 
uh, seems to me to be the real problem uh, you, were, you, were, you were raising. Can we collect maybe one other impression from Sarah? I mean, there, there's, okay, obviously okay. The, yeah. Yeah, yeah. there's obviously, there's obviously a... a I'm, I'm content not to talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm good at t talking very, very quickly, and I just want to put three questions to you, if you like, and pick any of them that you want to. I think that, I mean, I haven't seen you for a while, um, and I'm going to speak from Joburg um, to, to what you're saying. It seems to me that um, the city in your mind has become a highly abstract place, and I wanted to ask you about... You know, and we feel very far south of theory, if you like. So, so what is the move from people as infrastructure to the indifferent urban? Um, and what is the nature of the unraveling um, entailed in, you know, in indifference, not to difference, but indifference to indifference? Um, and what happens to that other thing about cities that I think has been valuable, at least, um, and, and, and still is, which is the, 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 the piecemeal halting unpredictable unraveling of the racial city and its recomposition, um, but also the incompleteness of global apartheid's attempts to completely colonize the city. It seems to me that's still a question that many of us are asking. So um, what, what, what's, what's going on in your mind in relation to the unraveling of how I used to read you, which is the thing about cities is that people make something. Um, and what is the, what, can you come back at us with the question of triple darkness in terms of the way in which you're thinking about the highly abstract city right now? Great question. Um, no, no, thank you for those, those very critical words and, 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 and comments. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it, 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 it's clear that in, 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 in this process of colonizing urban space, colonizing the, the efforts and the labor that so many residents have made over so many years, um, to make a city that was viable and functional and livable and enjoyable and productive for them, um, in many ways is coming to an end. And part of the sense is that, you know, when you've been working for 30 years in trying to build local institutions which resonate with that kind of effort, Local institutions that try to, in some ways, protect, defend, facilitate, um, and that much of that has been a failure. Much of that doesn't exist any longer. Um, then, then what is it that you do? What is it that you have to work with? And I guess all I'm suggesting is that in some ways, um, there are all of these efforts to dissimulate, to defend, to wheel and deal, to try to protect the integrity of a particular kind of work. But there's also ways in which one submits, one gives in, one rides piggyback over particular kinds of languages and forms and ways of doing things that don't seem to correspond to that work. And that you find ways to exist within them that in some sense turn them around or you use them in order to do, to do, other, to do other things. But that requires a sense of of a certain kind of gestation. It's like the, if you want to be born into a different world, in that sort of inversion of the triple darkness, if you want to come from the world instead of from a particular kind of genealogy, that too needs 
some kind of incubation. And so in some sense, the detachment, the sense of detaching, the sense of separation, the sense of not being integrable, of not really thinking about being integrable, may be a kind of strategic moment in which that gestation takes place. You, you taking something, you taking the devil on in some ways. You decide no matter how much you change the contours of the inside of these new ways of, of inhabitation, you still in some ways owe a lot of debt. You in debt, no matter how much you, whatever financial formula you, you know, you still live inside. You're still on the 40th floor somewhere. You know, no matter if all the floors you're extended, you're still on the 40th floor. You still don't have that much opportunity to shake and bake and rearrange and, you know, there are definitive limits. You can't just, in, no matter how much you experiment with that, you have to be careful about that embrace. And it, it, it requires some moments of, it requires some moments of, of hesitation in a way. I mean, when I talk about Kalibata, the, the way, the success of that is that people are not saying who they are. They're not strong statements. They're not saying, look it, I'm a Muslim and I, gotta, I want these three floors because I gotta, I, I'm going to protect this way of life. You don't say, I'm gay and I want these kind of, you don't say, I'm a young prophet. You don't say, I'm a whore and I have this street corner and I have these. People, not, you don't make those statements. Maybe at some point it's important to make statements. Maybe statements are important about, because you offer yourself up to the possibility of challenging the terms through which you're recognized or not. But sometimes you, you need not to make those kinds of statements. Sometimes the living with, in a way, requires the sense that these floors, you know they belong to these, this group, and these floors are these group, and this, but you're still, you're still in a kind of proximity to each other. You're still able to see each other, witness each other, pay attention to each other. As soon as you start throwing many statements around, as soon as you assert kind of things, then who knows whether or not that proximity is still going to be, to be possible. And I'm worried, I, I'm wary about the sort of notions of, of, of integration and relationality. I mean, I've been a Deleuzian almost all of my life, and like I, you know, made I made my money being talking about things being in association with each other and constant relationality, but there seems to be a particular lens by which everything is brought into relationship with each other, that somehow there's a kind of detachment that may need, be necessary, uh, away from the sort of incessant need to figure out what we are always in relationship to what something so it's not else. Abstraction, it's detachment. Yeah. So, so is, is this reliant also on detachment from the city itself? Because I, I wonder whether or not this mega interior, ultimately, if it does rely on density, if it does rely on proximity, if it does rely on building a myth, what does it not only look like, or how is it represented, but I mean, what are you hearing the further away you try to get to that. And, and we can go territorial on, according to your theory, on, on releasing a kind of storm of subletters, <laughs> which is what we're hearing now in the news. I mean, this is the total shakedown of a financial system. And, and I love that analogy, but, but ultimately, if this, if this interiorization is so reliant on density, then once there, what happens when there's a detachment from the city itself as an entity. And the second question follow up to that is, is that the war that's being waged today? Because the wars that are being waged today are actually in cities. They're not in remote areas. So this is just a, a speculation or a question that follows up on, on, the, on, the, on the issue of the interior. But also, I mean, what does happen if there's a detachment from the structure from the city? I mean, what do you, what do you are, are you hearing it? Are you, or is it you're not seeing it? No, what, what, what I'm trying to dis, what, I, what I'm trying to posit is is that within the interface between the popular and the vertical, there's a certain kind of turbulence. There's a certain kind of, you know, for for example, in some of the first generation 
of these vertical towers, nobody had an address. These were not on the map. You didn't have an address. You couldn't get mail there. You weren't registered. It's only recently that, that local governments come into these places and start registering people. This is, a big, this is a big move. In the first generation, where did I collect my mail? I had to go to someone living in the contiguous popular neighborhood and pay them a fee for receiving my mail. So you'd find households that were like, you know, post offices. They were, they were receiving the mail of like scores of residents of these, of, of these places. This was a kind of point of contact, okay? It was a point of, a point of some kind of, 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 of intersection, a point of some kind of discovery. There are ways in which those kinds of interfaces provide the, I mean, within these vertical towers, of course, they're gonna be a carrefour in, 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 in the basement level. Uh, a lot of people aren't gonna be able to afford it. Where are they gonna go to buy food? Where are they gonna go get services? Because, you know, the developer exits, who's gonna fix your, your, your stove? Nobody, you go to the, so there are exchanges. The city is still there, it's still, you know, because of the, of, of the composition, again, the composition of, of, of these places. But there is, of course, these are, these are, these are like, uh, um, these affordable towers also can't be denied as kind of, what, what, what do they call them, training wheels, you know, on, on a bike, the starter, like the starter house, you know, it's like getting people ready for that time when they can be detached, they don't need to collect their mail on the outside, they don't need to get, they don't need to buy food at the, so this is, this is also a kind of interstices where at some point this kind of, these kinds of reciprocities may be very much cut, cut. Uh, and, but, and, and of course this is a kind of, and more upmarket developments, this is of course what's happening. Because the way, the way in which they're advertised, it's like the big advertisements, join the world, come live, in Sagona Towers, be a part of the world, you know? So, you know, the only time you ever have to leave is to go to the airport, because the schools are there, the banks are there, the hospitals are there, you're eating, they're all there. You never have to touch the, touch the street. But I still think that in some ways, these are objects, these starter training wheel, <laughs> vertical, detach, these still can become objects of work and intervention. They can still be, you still work with them. You engage, you try to figure out, these are sites of a kind of struggle. You know, we, we rely upon, uh, too often our sites of struggle is that we rely upon things looking in a particular way in order to think, oh, this is what we have to struggle for. All I'm saying is let's like open it up. Let's see how, where people are actually putting their asses and their money and the way in which they're doing it, and, and, and let's see. I, I don't, you know, I'm, 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 I, I'm working with, you know, a project trying to put together new local governments that govern both of these spaces. And of course, the local governments see these new things as cash cows now that they are, are, gonna, be, are gonna be registered. But even at that level, they still, they are they raising the question, how do we manage this stuff? How do we, how, you know, this is sort of, how, and, and one has to try to be there to think through, well, how do we do it? Yeah. Uh, it's incredibly fascinating that in an age of, of essentially uh, uh, studying or mapping flows or potentially even fixtures that you're, you're calling for, perhaps paying attention to the moment at which the exchange occurs to be able to decipher, decode, potentially map in a completely different way. Um, I get the sense also that we could hijack the conversation and just ha have this. I'm thinking about Mohsen right now, who's in London, who's two o'clock in the morning, so I'm thinking we could take a few questions from the audience so that we, uh, in the interest of not keeping Mohsen up too late, um, we could also uh, have a few other questions from, from our audience. Pedro. Um, thank you. Uh, Malik, I have a question. We've, we've been having a conversation recently on precedent and how they incorporate the, the, the dialogue about cities and regulations and master plans. 
Yesterday we saw uh, once again a, a, an imperial president uh, intervening uh, Albania. It was the, the Apian way, the Roman Apian way was used as, a, as an archetype to intervene in Albania. And in this conversation of presidents, we've been seeing kind of this forms of organization that you describe in the popular or in the urban villages or, or, the, or other places as potential precedents that could be served into uh, urban plans or, or, or governance structures. So like seeing, for example, the Jakarta 2030 plan in which the world global, global city is present in, in a way it's given form to those, to those structures. Um, and then, then what I wonder is, would you see those, those forms that are building inside in those interiors or in the urban villages per se, um, would you see a way for them to be incorporated as precedents for the regulations um, that determine the, 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 yeah, the, the, the built environment, the, the city, the, the codes, the institutions? Is that? It's not so much a question, but a comment, so that's good, because maybe it'll keep the conversation going. I guess I just want to share, and then you can correct me if I'm wrong, but share what I think I heard in the presentation, because there was, it was so, there was so much going on. Um, but I feel like you're telling us a story about the appropriation of a social logic that had, I don't want to say it originated, but grew and developed in a certain spatial context in the popular neighborhoods, and how it unfolds and works in a new spatial context. And I think the idea of appropriation of these social relations is an important one because there is a kind of a downward spiral. I, I'm hearing a negative downward spiral in the use of these robust, vibrant social relationships in this high rise, super block tower spatial context has some kind of very negative implications. At least if I'm hearing when you say we lose voice, the heterogeneity of the space, despite the robustness of the social relationships, undermines the kind of social power that linked to those practices in the popular sector. If that's what you if that's part of the story you're telling us, I guess I would like you to reflect a little more on what does what does that mean for the future of the city and the future of the civic society or democratic or political society in a place like Indonesia? Because it's a very dark picture from my perspective. So actually Kind of building on Diane's comment, you end talking specifically about youth, which is quite looking forward to the future, and specifically with young women. Um, and it seems that you're translating their experience as they may not be empowered by um, cur like traditional currency, monetary currency, financial currency, but that their currency is narrative, is stories that they accumulate um, and thrive on. But that is a, quite a stark reality um, for a modern world where kind of financial stability is a bedstone. And it's, it's also quite a bleak future potentially for these young women in Indonesia and potentially in other cities where you've uh, interviewed urban youth. So kind of the trajectory of, of the youth and why you're interested in them and what the potential is for them in a world where they are not, um, well maybe they, they can rely on, on real, on, um, not that narratives isn't real, but something that actually empowers their future beyond kind of the coping mechanism of what a narrative may be. We can take more if you like. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it, it, I mean, it, 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 is, it is a, it is a dark picture. I mean, it is, but it, it is a dark picture. But this is what I'm saying. What you 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 have to ride that dark picture, um, and in some ways, it's. I mean, for for these young women, the the available the available alternative is to be part of the sort of like the happy Muslim family, you know, sort of you you, you get married, 
you do the sort of Muslim thing, even no matter how matter educated you are, you stay at home, you raise the kids, you're constantly on Instagram and Facebook and social media, and you're sharing images with other happy Muslim families about what it means to be happy, and you're always reconfirming the happiness with each other, and you get together for happy picnics, and then you have some imams that verify. I mean, this is the alternative in a way, not the only one, but what I'm, what, what, what I'm saying is, is the darkness in some ways that, that youth themselves are turning themselves into logistical instruments. They're thinking in terms of them, their bodies as logistical instruments. That is, how do, I, how do I circulate? How do I move? Who do I deal with? Don't stay put. Don't stay anchored. Don't worry about anchorage. Don't worry about a trajectory, a particular aspiration. And that is a kind of sort of, that's, a, that's in a sense a holding pattern, a holding in abeyance. And I think the holding in abeyance doesn't get us anywhere, but maybe that's the only where that there is possible at the moment. And at least if we hold things in abeyance, for now, maybe that's the only wave to ride. That darkness may be the only, so, what, it mean, what does it mean for the future of, of, of civic culture? It means of, yes, I think we all want to be like Barcelona. We all want to have that kind of pos, pos, possibility. That's not on the horizon for, 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 for most urban regions. And it doesn't mean that people don't aspire to it, don't struggle for it, don't attempt to, to take, take it on. But there is a way in which there is that yes, if capital works through the proliferation of effervescent socialities, then does something that is not capital also operate through that very same circuit? And sometimes it's indiscernible, and sometimes we can't recognize the divisions. The boundaries are blurred, the interfaces are. But yet, I think that that's, that's I mean, if that's the way in which people preclude their complete eviction from, from the city. I mean, look at what, look at, look at, look at, you, you know what's happened in, in Mexico City. People bought assets at the way periphery. They bought into, they, they loaded themselves up with debt, buying things for themselves that they thought was, was going to be their security. Ten years later, these things are collapsing. There's all this attempt to, like Jakarta too. People are telling their kids, find any way you can to get back into the center, the unaffordable center. Do whatever you can to get, to get back. Under what circumstances? If it means just in some ways to deter, in some ways, the complete eviction from the ability to operate, no matter how feral those operations are, this is this is the game then. Really quickly though, but I think let, well, I, since we're in a design and architect design and architecture school, I, I, I I'm totally with your I, it's interesting you're about Mexico and I, I I'm with everything you've said, but I I feel like there's an, uh, the kind of elephant in the room here is the physicality of the built environmental context in which it is happening. So the abandonment of housing in Mexico is precisely because they're not building high rises. So there's a problem with like low density, but I think your story is there's a terrible problem with the, the super black high density. So it's not just about social relationships and the darkness of neoliberalism. There's some independent agency of the physical context in which this is happening, which is not unrelated to neoliberalism. You build these high rises because land costs a lot in the center of the city, but it's the kind of clashing of that social response the uh, social appropriation or the reliance on social relationships and what that looks like in those types of physical buildings that's part of the dark story. So I, yeah. I just w couldn't help but putting that on the table for us here because we are designing spaces for people to live in and we have to be aware of not just the cost and the size but the social relationships that will unfold and appropriate those physical spaces and w what is the long-term prognosis for those types of places that we're building. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I mean, much of Jakarta had the, had the model. Yeah. It had high density, you know, high density, green, well managed. I mean, it had the built, and it systematically takes it. It systematically takes it apart. Yes, but in light of that, in light of that, what do we do then with the built? I mean, the the housing. You know, the housing backlogs are are are. are, are uh, absolutely an, enorm, an, enormous. That's the that's the dilemma. Um, and you know, and and, archi and and you know, and architecture, you know, will fly in and they'll do their three week, you know, studios and they. But yeah, it, it, it really requires a sustained engagement over years to. Yeah, uh, Malika, I would just like you to, when you talk a lot about verticality. Um, in Johannesburg, of course, we have uh, we don't really have the kind of structures I saw uh, in, in in the images, um, where where buildings are, uh, are erected, especially for the purpose of provisioning uh, housing, uh, popular housing. Uh, the structure is rather horizontal, uh, as in the townships. RDP houses and all that. So um, I, I would like you to, to reflect on this question of verticality in Jakarta in relation to your earlier work in places such as Johannesburg or Lagos, where, where, where verticality is, doesn't seem to me to be the, uh, the structuring principle. Uh, and horizontality and ex expansion, including spatial expansion, is, is rather the uh, the norm. Uh, I know you, you said you have, you have now moved beyond your delusion uh, moment, uh, uh, but, but the rhizomatic uh, nature of uh, the African post-colonial city uh, seems to, uh, to be at odds with the type of uh, uh, high-rise uh, structures you were showing. So how, how would you, uh, using uh, these post-colonial cities and Jakarta uh, make sense of uh, not where, where the post-colonial uh, city is going, but the future of urban forms uh, in different uh, locations uh, in the global south. No, I mean, I, 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 I think that, that, it, that one, that many auto-constructed popular neighborhoods have Really successfully dealt with that with that with that question uh, in exemplary ways, uh, both economically, both in terms of the built environment, both in terms I mean all of the but 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 systematically torn apart because of where they exist, and they are not you can't they are they're not replicable in terms of a kind of top-down design imposition at the at the periphery. You can't do it. These are these are projects that are, have been built over over for, forty years, and we basically destroyed so so many of them. Okay, that's 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 done. And now people say, well, let's well, well we can do it on much more affordable land. We can roll it all out without understanding the kinds of processes of. Of, of give and take and struggles and contestations and reciprocities that went that went it went into that, so that's done. So you there's no choice in some ways than to replicate in some ways the 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 the, 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 the verticality. I mean, look at in 1992 in in Johannesburg, when when the when people started to try to think about how you run jo Johannesburg. Uh, to try to find someone that was interested in what was then the existing vertical city was nearly impossible. People had no idea that Hillbrow and Berea and Joubert Park and the center were being occupied in new and very interesting and dynamic ways. No one took seriously that this kind of built environment was the incipient of a kind of post-racial urban South Africa 
that could have been exemplary for no one was interested in it for good reasons you know you, they had orange farm to take care of so way to take care of. they had what you what you described but at a certain historical point you couldn't get anyone to pay attention to Hillbrow and the downtown until it was too late until infrastructure was overburdened with too many subcontracting arrangements uh, when it became too territorialized fights, when the illicit economies got too instantiated, when so in in in, in some in in some ways I, I there are so many yeah so many missed missed op, missed opportunities um, And in terms of precedence, you see, this, is, this becomes a very tricky, this becomes a very tricky thing. Because the president of Indonesia, he, 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 the former governor of Jakarta, won the presidency in part because of his recognition of the popular in a way. But when he comes to become the, the governor and, and, and the president, all of a sudden things begin to change. But in some ways, he wants to try to institutionalize a kind of abstraction of the popular as the new basis for institutional life. And it doesn't, so there are these kinds of other, other possible precedents. But that abstract, I mean, how do you, that's the question, how do you translate something that has been done over a long period of time into a few essential principles that then you try to generalize across the city. It's, diff it's, it's very difficult to do. And there are, there are gonna be distortions and there are gonna be experiments. And so a lot of political capital, Jokowi, has expended upon a lot of failures that somehow were his attempt in some ways to find new institutional forms for the, for the popular. So it's a tricky game again. Hi, <clears throat> I just wanted to sort of touching on what you just said to maybe revive the question that was asked earlier and if I understood it correctly, which was, do you see anything like a kind of nascent urbanism within these vertical uh, settlements like typologies, like you mentioned the three-floor mosque, for example. Um, I mean, as architects and urbanists, we're maybe thinking, like, um, is there a kind of ground-up experimentation that's happening that might produce something, a model that might be reproduced? Like, if not by politicians, then maybe by architects or designers discovering in the vertical informal, like the basis of a new urban code or something like that. Is that what you were getting at? No, in, 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 in one of these projects, a, 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 an important battle was fought over, I mean, it was a kind of cross-subsidized thing. So you build a kind of middle-class thing and then you put up all these sort of more affordable, towers next to it in a kind of cross-subsidy relationship. So the question, the big battle was, is do you give, un, do you spend money on underground parking for the poor sections of that area? And the decision was made, no. We don't, and there was a struggle about this. The struggle is the money that it's gonna cost you to build underground parking, we're gonna put in devoting the ground level into scores of small eating places, small shops, small. So residents will fight it out, parking their cars every day. There'll be all kinds of arrangements trying to get cars in and cars out. People complain about it all the time. But that thing works. The heterogeneity of that place works because of just that decision. The decision was to forgo underground parking and spend the money into making the ground level all of these different small commerces, daycare centers, leisure, where people could watch each other. 
They don't necessarily have to have anything to do with each other. They don't necessarily have to talk to each other, but they could see each other. They could witness each other. And an important part of, of the collective machine of these places is a set, the ethics of indifference. The ethics of indifference is really important in this. That is, I, I look at, I mean, I know that when we deal with each other, that what you do has some implications for me, has some ramifications for me. I mean, all of us in the room, if we're, if we're living with each other, we all know that whatever we do has a kind of impact on each other. But one of the key ethics of sort of auto-constructed popular districts was this ethic of indifference. That is, I will look at you and I will see that what you do doesn't have implications for me. I let you in some sense be. And that's an important kind of affordance of opportunity and space because then you can have a kind of relationship with a larger city that might be different from mine. And I may need that at some point. It's the basis of a kind of complementarity. If we sort of rein each other in, if we always have to have this sense that what you do is related to what I do and what I do, and that any move that you make has all these implications for my life, we then rein each other in, and then we limit our exposures and our, our forays into the larger urban arena. And we might need that kind of differentiation in the long run of how we continue to adapt in face of all these kinds of changes. So what's important was the, that, that forego for, uh, of underground parking led to some built intervention that helped sustain and reproduce that ethics of indifference, which is a sort of fundamental practice to the ability of people to collaborate with each other. It's kind of an incredible point to finish on, I think, um, especially given the fact that if, in fact, Mosin is still awake and, and, and watching us, there, there also has been one of the polemics of essentially throwing down the gauntlet at the three-week fly-in, fly-out studio, and if I'm hearing you properly, uh, proposing a multi-year research project w with Ab Abdul Malik Simon and, and, and perhaps Sarah and, and Ashil. So you've just put yourself on the hook for a big project, and I think that's, pretty, that's actually pretty exciting. Maybe, in fact, we need to revive the long-term Harvard research projects to be able to see uh, these processes differently. Thank you very much, Abdi Malik, Sarah, Ashil. Thank you again. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>